Well, good morning. If you would take your Bibles and turn with me to Colossians chapter 3. Someone asked me this morning about a verse that they wanted to use for a project, and I suggested Colossians 3.20, and they quipped, oh, we'll be there in about two months. <laughs> and this is true. I did not protest, nor did I object, <laughs> which I can, and I've been trained to do, so. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, we'll get there sooner than that, I believe, but we are going to be spending some time on this issue of what Paul is teaching in Colossians 3.19 about the husbands and the importance of what the husband is called to do as a believer. And this is important to be mindful of. We're, we're being taught by and through God's Word how Christian men love their wife. And so this is important for us to be mindful of and to understand that you are receiving instruction and that you are to cherish and to um, treasure the Word of God and to use it as a lamp to guide your life. And so if you want to know what it is that you're supposed to be doing, you're being taught that. And so this is important time for us all. It's good to be reminded of these things. We are people who are easily distracted and we often forget things. And so we want to be mindful of what God's Word says. And this is why we come here, to worship the Lord in word and song and to lift up our hearts, to engage our minds. And that's what we'll be doing this morning, I pray. And to that end, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this time together. Thank you for this day that you've given to us. Thank you for these folks who have gathered here this morning to spend time together fellowshipping, worshiping, uh, using their spiritual gifts, edifying each other, building each other up in the most precious faith. We are grateful for the genius of the local New Testament church. Thank you, Lord, for this unique opportunity that you have so graciously given to us. May we cherish it, not coming in a begrudging way or hesitantly, but to come to lift up our hearts and minds in adoring worship, pondering the great role and work that you have done in our lives through Jesus Christ and who we are saved. We treasure, Lord, all that you have provided to us, and we treasure Christ and help us to treasure him more and help us to be mindful of all that he has done for us. May he always be the object of our faith. Help us to learn today, Lord. Help us to take these words into our heart. It is out of the heart that comes the issues of life and May our heart then govern our conduct based upon the content of God's Word. We pray these things in the name of our blessed Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen. Importantly, we need to go back and lay the foundation because Paul here is making a transition when we consider the content of this particular portion of Colossians chapter 3. And it bears repeating because this foundation is significant. If you get this foundation wrong, the rest of this chapter doesn't make a lick of sense. And you want to make certain that you're understanding who you are in Jesus Christ. Paul's theme in the book of Colossians is our union with Jesus Christ. And if you forget that, then these things become legalistic in their performance. They become perfunctory or they're completely ignored altogether. And we don't want that. We want and should be engaging in these activities, these imperatives, if you will, these duties, in a delightful, loving way, out of joy for what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, which Paul has in a very eloquent and persuasive way presented to us in the first two chapters and in part of chapter 3 as well. Noting that we have been clothed in a new nature by the work of God through the finished work of Jesus Christ, Paul expects and anticipates that your conduct is going to be different. If it isn't different, it begs a question as to whether or not you truly know the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think this is something today in the evangelical world in which we live that has been lost. Truth no longer matters. Your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. You better never tell me what your truth is, and I can't tell you what my truth is. But we're all going to get along anyway and somehow figure this out. <laughs> 
Well, we are looking at the Word today, God's Word, which contains the truth, which is the truth. And so we want to make certain then that we're understanding how it is that Christians live. This new creational lifestyle, if you will, is so important for Paul, and he anticipates that Christians are going to live like Christians ought to live, and as God requires them to. That's significant. And so this beginning section here of this latter half of the chapter, this midsection, if you will, at verse 12 is so very important. And it begins with the word so that we've talked about. So verse 12 says, so as those, as those who have been chosen of God, Paul tying the conduct that we engage in, and importantly, husbands, the act of you loving your wife is connected to God's electing you. God's choosing of you. The doctrine of election is a foundational doctrine that is important for Paul and serves as a motivating factor for you to do what God has called you to do. So, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, the principle of forbearance, and forgiving each other, the principle of forgiveness, Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. That's not optional. That's Christianity 101. If that's not being done, then there's a massive, massive problem. A massive problem. Verse 14, beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. We talked about that last week. This idea of love is so important for Paul because it... it, 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 it It allows these imperatives to be performed in the right way. And we're going to talk about that more today as we get into Ephesians chapter 5. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called, to one body and be thankful. That principle of peace ruling in in, in your life applies in your marriage too. It doesn't just apply in the context of your secular life outside of your home, and then you get to go home and be super angry and mean all the time. No, this issue of peace ought to rule both in the church and in the home as well. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. Verse 16, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do, now keep this in mind, folks, this applies to your marriage too. Whatever, it doesn't say whatever except in your marriage. It doesn't say just when you feel like it. It says, whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. So that's, there, there's your baseline foundation. We now move into these additional imperatives in the context of the family. Wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, Love your wives and do not be embittered against them. Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they will not lose heart. I can't wait to get to that verse. There's a lot there for dads, and we all need work in that area. And so we've taken the time then to unpackage the meaning of this uh, in terms of of, uh, application. We took the time last week to further unpackage uh, verse 19, further illuminating the meaning of the word love, tying it back into verse 14, which was so very important and something that I wanted to do, making certain that you're understanding that love is that bond that holds this all together both in the context of how we act with each other in the church as well as how we interact with each other in the home between a husband and a wife. And ultimately, we'll even see that principle applied in terms of children and the way we raise them as well when we get to verse 21. And so with that in mind, we are aware then of these principles that ought to be present. Now, this is important, and I want to make certain, again, that that you're understanding that This is instruction to you as a Christian man who is married and how you treat your wife. That's incredibly important. You cannot miss that point. And what's important about it is that it's not an option. For Paul, it's axiomatic that a husband who was a believer, that is, it necessarily follows 
that this is going to be evident in your home and in your relationship with your wife. It's like when you cut open an orange, you expect it to smell like an orange. It's axiomatic that when you cut the orange open, it's going to smell like an orange. And that's the way I say orange, orange. I've said it that way for a long time, like, 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 like doing the wash. <laughs> but I do say milk right. <laughs> Not milk. But nonetheless, so for husbands, you're like an orange. When you cut the orange open, it's going to smell like an orange. If you're a Christian husband, you're going to love your wife in the way that the the God's Word says you ought to. And so what I want to make certain is that the work of, of the Word is reaching into your heart through the Holy Spirit to the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. Now, the convicting work of the Holy Spirit may come from the sharp elbow of your wife today. That's okay. That's all right. And and wives, you can do that. That's all right. Maybe that is the Holy Spirit working, and, you know, he might need that. But nonetheless, this is important for you to understand. And we want to make certain that we're not missing that particular point. Oftentimes, we approach Scripture in somewhat of a sterile way. We, we, we kind of look at it, and we are willing to say, yeah, that person needs to do that. I wish they did that better. Boy, if, if, if so-and-so would only do this, then I would be, you know, that would be great. But no, this is about you men in the context of the relationship that you have with your wife. And so, let's get, look at Ephesians. Let's go over to Ephesians, because we're going to use God's Word to help us understand God's Word. So, so Paul makes a very short powerful statement. Last week, we unpackaged the meaning of the word love. This agape word is very important in Scripture. We also contrasted it to the opposite of that, which is the issue of being embittered or being harsh. Husbands don't get to be that way. I would submit to you that that's more often the case than the other, so we need to work on that, guys. That's important. We're gonna make, we need to make that application and make it real. And so what we do then, we turn to Ephesians chapter 5 and we have further illumination as to the breadth and depth and scope of this love. Now we've begun to touch on those things in a somewhat surface way. I want to plumb deeper into the significance of what Paul then teaches in Ephesians chapter 5. Chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5 beginning with verse 22. We might as well go back and get the context, verse 22 through um, uh, 33. The important hermeneutical principle of using God's Word to interpret God's Word. And this is what we have here with this particular passage in Ephesians 5. 22. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. So their men all of us, we're going to see something that Paul does that he doesn't do in Colossians, and that is he addresses the issue of the husband's headship. And I'm going to have more to say about that later in the context of some of the other passages that we have, in particular verse 21 as it relates to rearing children and things of that nature. But note this. Note that this issue of headship is important. And we've talked about that before as being part of the creational ma- mandate that we find in Genesis chapters 1 through 3. Paul incorporating what's in the beginning of the Bible, which is incredibly important, into this relationship and understanding how the relationship ought to work. If the headship isn't there, then it's not a correct biblical, uh, I, I, I guess, performance by the husband in relationship to what he is called to be. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. So we're going to notice how Paul draws the correlation between Christ's relationship with the church and the husband relationship with the wife, the parallel. He's always comparing and, and contrasting those two things and calling the husband to live with his wife in that context. So that's where you are, guys. Don't forget that he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. And we've talked about that. So verse 25, husbands, 
Love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. This is a powerful passage. There's a lot there. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Well, we have further even illumination of the role of the, of the obligation of the wife in regards to the relationship with the husband. But importantly, Paul spends more time talking about the husband than he does the wife, and there's more instruction in Scripture directed to the husband than there is to the wife in that regard, which I think is significant. And so what we find here in, in particular in verses 22 through uh, the latter portion of the chap- of this particular passage through verse 33, Paul, as in Colossians 3.18, he's given instruction regarding um, the husband's role in the home. In verses 25 through 32, Paul turns his attention to the husbands, a transition from headship to loveship. That's interesting. A transition, as we've noted, from headship to loveship, not ruleship. He's not giving, it's interesting to me that with regard to the issue of headship, Paul doesn't automatically fall into a pattern of giving a list of things that indicate that the husband is properly engaged in headship. He moves into the issue of love, knowing that proper headship's foundation is based in love. He doesn't give the husband a ton of rules to follow. He teaches them how to love their wife, and he knows doing that will cause them to lead properly in the home, which will then in turn cause the wife in response, especially a believing wife, to want to be what she is called to be. Now, you're called to be that regardless if he's doing these things right or wrong. But nonetheless, it's much easier if he's doing it this way as opposed to the other. I think that's significant. And so for Paul, you would think, if you and I wrote this chapter, what would we do? Oh, we'd be spending a lot of time on headship. And there'd be a ton of rules. There'd be all kinds of lists of things and all the obligations of, of the people under us, Right? Very few about us, but a lot about the rest of you. That's what would happen. So, notice the transition from headship to loveship, not ruleship. Men, you got to get this, because our tendency is to want to do that. Our tendency is to want to be kind of heavy-handed. You know, the iron fist and the velvet glove kind of thing. But it's all about love. It's all about how the husband then lovingly leads his wife in the context of a Christian home. This, of course, harkens back to Colossians 3.14 as it relates to the issue of that bond of love which creates unity. This is the overarching theme. Let's be reminded by Scripture as well about this issue of love. Turn to 1 Corinthians 13. Let's just be reminded of what this love is and isn't. Paul here, of course, in the context of Corinthians, addressing the issue of the abuse of spiritual gifts within the church. There was great division within the Corinthian church. There was a lot of bragging going on. There were a lot of problems connected to people asserting their rights and positions and powers over others relative to their particular gift. Paul reminds them that love is the overarching leveler of all gifts and is the unity that the bond of unity, again, as 314 refers to, that should ought, ought to be of focus for us. 
so verse 4 in 13, chapter 13, 1 Corinthians 13, 4. So here are some things about love. Love is patient. Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Does not take into account a wrong suffered. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away with. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. Man, do we need that. Wow. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully just as I have been fully known. But now faith, hope, love abide these three. But the greatest of these is love. So we we note the content and the character of love. We need to be reminded of that because, men, this is how you're called to relate to your wife. And to be mindful of these important principles. Now, wives, you too, Titus chapter 2, you're called to love your husband. And so these principles are there for you as well. But significantly for the husband, his headship is governed by his loveship. And we know what love means now from God's word. And Paul then further illuminates the meaning of that term back in Ephesians chapter 5 by tying it back into how Christ loves the church, which is significant. So Ephesians chapter 5 teaches profound and amazing truths. But one of the most revolutionary concepts concepts is that Christian husbands are to love their wives as Christ loves loved the church. Now, I want you to think about that. That is a revolutionary concept. It was a revolutionary concept then because in, the, in, in regards to how men and women interacted during this period of history, it was significant. It was fairly abusive in terms of how women were viewed and the role of the man and the nature of marriage and the sanctity of marriage and the importance of marriage. So when Paul comes along and begins to teach these things, it's significant. It's interesting to me that in in terms of the book of Colossians, we know that Paul is dealing with a false teacher, that there is a false teacher who has come in. It's interesting that Paul, in regards to all the time and effort that he's been taking with regard to addressing the teachings of this false teacher, takes the time to address this particular issue. The likelihood is that the false teacher was undermining the nature of Christian marriage. That he was attacking it and causing people to have the wrong focus as it relates to what marriage is and its importance. And so again, as he does with the entire epistle, he takes everybody back to Jesus Christ as the foundation, as the focal point as it relates to what a Christian will do in their marriage, is governed by the principles that we find in Christ's relationship with his bride, the church. That's incredibly important. So that's why it's a revolutionary concept. And I would submit to you that even today it's revolutionary in many respects, as so many forms of humanism and feminism and all sorts of other isms have crept into the church undermining the biblical foundation for marriage and the principles that govern it. Notice as well, too, that we are addressing this to Christian husbands. Paul is writing to believers. If you go back to Colossians 3.19, you're in Ephesians 5, but go back and we're there. He says husbands. The term husband is modified in chapter 1 by Paul referring to all those in Colossae as holy ones holy ones. And so the category is very specific as it relates to whom, to whom he is addressing this instruction. So this is instruction to Christian husbands. Christian husbands. So Christian husband, this is what you do. Pastor, what is God's will for my life? 
Well, here you got it. You're wondering whether or not you should buy the big truck or not. I'm telling you how to love your wife. God's more concerned about that than the big truck. No, there's nothing wrong with having a big truck. I like big trucks too. But oftentimes we take this whole issue of God's will into meeting our, our wants rather than what we really truly need, which is instruction on how to love our wives. Right? This is significant. So to Christian husbands, a specific category, a revolutionary concept. Martin Lloyd-Jones really quite masterfully uh, expresses the groundbreaking nature of what Paul is teaching here. He notes the following. This statement, when it was written by the apostle, was one of the most astounding that had ever been put on paper. Now, this is, he's making reference to Ephesians 5, but the same holds true for Colossians 3. When we read of the pagan view of marriage, and especially the typical attitude of husbands toward wives, and indeed not only pagan, but also what you read of in the Old Testament, we see how revolutionary and transforming the teaching is. Now, that, that's significant. I like the idea, too, that Lloyd-Jones even teases out the distinctions as it relates to what was going on in the Old Testament. There is a, there is a radical transformation. Now, it's radical in the context of the behavior that is expected. That same behavior was expected in the Old Testament. The people got the issue of the heart wrong, and that was a problem. But in particular, the emphasis now is being driven home that is new creation in Jesus Christ, you're going to treat your wife in a different way. Perhaps even differently than the Old Testament saints treated theirs. And all the attendant problems that were the consequence of their mistreatment of their wives and God's principle of marriage. Polygamy was not the norm. That's a sin. Solomon paid the price for that. The wisest man in the world got it wrong. And it led him into all sorts of errors and problems. So men, again, think about this. It's revolutionary. It's transforming. This, this particular teaching. So tragically... Some Christian men think that headship means dictatorship or lordship, being the boss. Thus, the Christian doctrine of headship has been misused to justify the physical and mental abuse of women. And I have seen this. I have a specific example in my mind right now. Keeping women in their place, demeaning and controlling women, working wives to death or neglecting them. That was the pagan way. That's how it was when Paul wrote this in terms of addressing what was necessarily going on as a consequence of that time frame. But Christian husbands who abuse or neglect their wives don't understand authentic Christian marriage. They don't understand loving, servant leadership, and they certainly don't understand Ephesians chapter 5. And, and we all know this guy, right? We've, we've come across him. And we have to guard our hearts, men, against becoming him. Because our tendency is to fall into that category. We, we want to be heavy-handed. We want, we want to take the velvet glove off the iron hand. Because we think we're going to get more done with it. So our default tendency is to go into the trap of being the exact opposite of what Scripture calls us to be. Sadly, today, what's happening, too, is that, is that there's a tendency, and I think there's, a, there's, a, there's an issue that we have to be careful with. We are to lead in a loving way. That does not mean in an acquiescing way or in an abrogating way. That is, we do not divest ourselves of the authority that God has given to us. What we need to learn is to lead biblically, which means to lead lovingly, not to become effeminate or passive with respect to our obligations in the home. This is a massive problem right now. I have spoken to this issue. I am concerned about this issue where you end up, we have the old phrase, she wears the pants. That's not biblical. Not that she can't wear pants. This is not a fundamentalist Baptist church. <laughs> 
half you ladies here today would be in massive trouble back in the 1970s Baptist church. You can wear pants. It's okay. But in a metaphorical sense, you cannot wear the pants. He's supposed to have the pants on. Give them back to him. So, we have, to, we have to keep these things in mind, see? We understand the revolutionary concepts. We understand, we're beginning to understand the standards that are applied. And, and, and we have to remember, you are to think biblically, men, about your marriage and your role in it in light of your union with Christ. So again, in Colossians, that's the overarching theme. I am united with Christ. I am joined to Christ. As a consequence of that, I'm going to live in a different way, in a very different way. Dave Harvey, in his really wonderful little book called When Sinners Say I Do, makes the following statement. Make no mistake about it. How a husband and wife build their marriage day by day and year by year is fundamentally shaped by their theology. It, theology, governs how you think, what you say, and how you act. Your theology governs your entire life. Your entire life. That's what Paul is saying here. That's what he says in verse 13, or rather verse 12 of chapter 3. So, based upon what God has done, that's theology, God's choosing you, that's theology, you're going to act in a certain way as holy and beloved ones, put on, do these things, engage in these activities. Your theology determines how you live in your marriage. Importantly and significantly, your reality, your reality is shaped by Scripture. Shaped by Scripture. Not the world's picture of what the perfect marriage looks like. Not, not some arcane idea about the roles of men and women in the home and, and what those are and what they are not according to the world. But rather, what does God's Word say? And so, so for example, so... When we talk about theology, I'm giving you a lot of theology. Everyone thinks about God. Everyone's a theologian. R.C. Sproul said that, and I believe it's true, and he even wrote a book about it, and it's a good book, and you ought to read it. Everyone's a theologian. When you think about God, you have to then begin to understand what it is that he requires, and you go to his word to understand what it is that he requires and who he is and why he does what he does. That's going to then inform what you then do in regards to how you relate, in particular here, to your wife. To your wife. And so your reality is shaped by Scripture. Day in, day out. So, men, we're talking about theology. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 5. We're studying these words. We're looking at Colossians chapter 3. We see here that we're getting a lot of theology, 1 Corinthians 13, the issue of love, how love is defined by Scripture, what does love look like in the context of a Christian home and a Christian church, all of those things. So what do we know? To be a good theologian and consequently a good spouse, we must study God as He really is. We have to know who He is. We must get our understanding and interpretation of God and reality from Scripture. It is in Scripture that God has revealed truly His character, His activity, His heart, and His glorious redemptive plan. Most profoundly in the Bible, we encounter God as He ultimately made Himself known in in the person of Jesus Christ. Christ is the truth. So if Christ loves the church this way, and Paul says you are to love your wife that way, that is the truth. You don't have truth one and truth two. You don't have options A, B, and C. You don't get to have your own truth about what it means to be a Christian husband. God is telling you what it is. Christ is communicating that to you through his love for his bride. 
the church. To know Christ is to know the truth. And a truth-based marriage is inherently centered on Christ. And so what we find then is that the Bible is really central to a solid marriage, to a biblical marriage. That doesn't mean it's going to be perfect. We're still sinners. We're still in need of God's grace. You still have to go to 1 John 1, 9. And as a husband, you may be there all day. Confessing your failure as a husband, not living up to what God has called you to be, asking for his grace to equip you, to fill you with his spirit so you can better do the things that he has called you to do. And this is why the Bible is so important. Again, Dave Harvey in his book says the following, as God's word, it fills marriages with eternal and glorious significance. It also speaks as an authority on what a marriage is meant to be. It is both the evaluative standard for marriage and the key to joy in marriage. It's a wonderful, freeing thing to realize that the durability and quality of your marriage is not ultimately based on the strength of your commitment to your marriage. Rather, it's based on something completely apart from your marriage. God's truth, truth we find plain and clear on the pages of Scripture. Some may say and come to me, well, pastor, I have a problem in my marriage. Am I supposed to tell them to try harder to be married? Just just be more married. Try harder. Do more. Uh, Like my dad used to say, go drive a stake in the back of the yard and look at it to remind yourself that you're married. That's not what we do. That's not what he was saying, but he's saying that could be the problem. Again, you're not looking to be more committed to your marriage. I, please get, this is what, look what Paul's doing. Paul doesn't say to the husband, be more committed to your marriage. Try harder in your marriage. He says to them, love your wife like Christ loves the church. He's driving them back into Christ. Automatically, the husband's going to be saying to himself, well, how on earth did Christ love the church? What did he do? How did he do it? When did he do it? How long did he do it? Why does he do it? That's what's going on. So guys, I'm not, I'm not saying to you, and I don't want you to leave here today with some concept that it's just about a try harder thing. It's not about trying harder. It's about loving Christ more, about loving God's word more being a better student of the scripture relative to how you are to understand Jesus Christ and as a consequence, how you are to love your wife. This is the problem. Do you notice that I don't have on the church sign five steps to a better marriage? It's not about that. And that's the problem with marriage conferences. People come away with a long legalistic list of things to do. Try harder. That's the law. That's not the gospel. Do more. Try harder. Do this list. That's the law. The law says do. The law says do. The law says do. The gospel says what? Done. Done. And so, a solid marriage, a commitment, a a loving marriage is based on something completely apart from your marriage. You know, one of the things I do when I meet with people about marriages and counseling in that context, I ask them about their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the baseline, right? Got to get that piece fixed and corrected. If it's not there, then it can turns into a witnessing session about the gospel. But if it is there, then I talk to them about the issue of what does God's word say about the gospel about the transformative work of the gospel, about the truth that's contained in the gospel, about who the gospel is about, and what that means to me. This is what Paul is doing, right? He's been building the whole issue of the gospel up in the context of laying the foundation before he even gets to the imperatives. It's the motivation. And so God's truth, God's truth is the strength of a biblical marriage. And in God's truth, we find the plain and clear instruction that God has for us. And so, we want to make certain men that we're understanding those important things. 
So what we find then in Ephesians chapter 5 is this. The standard for regulating the husband's leadership is Christ's own self-sacrificing love. The standard for regulating the husband's leadership is Christ's own self-sacrificing love. Now, Paul talks about headship. We find that clearly in verse 23. That is completely unavoidable. Headship is not the consequence of the fall. We've dealt with that. Headship is, is not something that, that came about because it was a disaster to begin with and had to be fixed in some way. No, it was there. It's been corrupted by sin. Men give it up, don't do what they're supposed to do. And when they do do it, oftentimes it's done incorrectly because they take the love element out of it. And so we want to make certain the standard for regulating the husband's leadership is Christ's own self-sacrificing love. That's what Paul begins to say in verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. So automatically, right out of the gate, we know that this love is sacrificial in nature. The husband's love for the wife is sacrificial. Sacrificial. Well, that's a game changer right there. That's going to change a lot of things. Men, if you're not loving your wife sacrificially, then you're missing the mark. When you miss the mark, that's called sin. And that's wrong. So we need to make certain we're addressing that. So what Ephesians 5, it's important to note this. Ephesians 5 does not command the husband to rule or take control of his wife. Wow. Now, people get this wrong. But Ephesians 5 does not command the husband to rule or take control of his wife. Nor does it tell husbands to force their wives to be subject to them. Now, now again, if you and I wrote it, that's how it would be. I don't care if we even had a committee do it. It'd be even worse. Rather, Ephesians 5 commands the husband to love as Christ loves. One theologian captures it this way. The vocation of the husband's headship does not imply that the man's will ought necessarily to prevail. Paul does not speak of the husband having his way, but rather of his love sacrifice. Now, again, we don't want to get into a context in which we, we define love in such a way as to mean I give everything up. This is the problem that we have today with the second commandment issue. It seems as if we have to love someone by compromising our convictions. That's love. We see that often from, I don't know, Together for the Gospel, the Gospel Coalition, all the people in the big Eva camp seem to want to go down that path with love. I never saw Jesus Christ love that way. He didn't give up anything relative to who he was as God ordained. So again, we want to make certain that this is not about just having your will prevail or having your way. We, we can have a perspective from, as one person noted, the husband who plops himself in front of the TV and orders his wife around like a slave has abandoned Christ for Archie Bunker. Some of you are saying, who on earth is Archie Bunker? <laughs> well... I'll let Dell explain it to you later. I don't know. It's just... <laughs> I mean, literally, there are people sitting here right now who have no clue who Archie Bunker is. That's amazing, quite frankly. <laughs> we weren't allowed to watch Archie Bunker. <laughs> we weren't allowed to watch Happy Days either, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> we were good Baptists. <laughs> And I'm going to heaven because of it. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't watch Happy Days, so I'm going to heaven. <laughs> oh, dear. If you don't laugh, you'll cry. But nonetheless, uh, it's all your fault, Mom. I know. It's just... Uh, but you could say I'm just doing what Dad said, right? Yeah, that's right. 
Uh, you were, indeed. I don't, no doubt. Well, we don't want that. And if you need to know who Archie Bunker was, he was the picture of the male chauvinist pig in the 1970s. He was everything that was wrong with men. And he was portrayed in that way and characterized in that way. And we certainly don't want to be that as Christian men. We don't want to be the Archie Bunkers of the world. Oftentimes, though, these passages are misused, and, and, and we need to make certain that we understand this as well. We focus on the issue of submission with regard to the wife while neglecting the teaching regarding the husband's duty to love their wives as Christ loves the church. Many men have the ability to ignore the Ephesians 5 command that a husband love his wife and to focus exclusively on the woman's submission. They seem to think the only thing the Bible says about marriage is wives submit. And this is a striking imbalance because most of Ephesians 5 addresses the husband's duty to love his wife. The greater responsibility falls on the husband to imitate Christ-loving leadership. To imitate Christ-loving leadership. And so, again, looking at these passages, we see that we are called then as men in a context of a marriage to love our wife as Christ loves the church. That is to love her in a sacrificial way. And we understand that Christ did that. And so what we're going to do then next Sunday is to tease out in detail how it is that Christ loved the church using those then to apply to our role as a husband and to have then something against which we measure our lives. And again, there's nothing wrong with that in terms of understanding what God's word says. Paul says, men, love your wife as Christ loves the church. So you need to know that. You need to know what that looks like. The first important thing, so number one, is sacrificially. Putting her needs above yours. Not asserting your rights all the time. Now, I want to say something. It's important. Again, we have so misdefined the word love today that it's even somewhat difficult to talk about it. Because in people's minds, it can mean so many different things. It certainly does not mean that men are to give up their leadership responsibilities in the home. The same holds true for in the church. I believe this is why we're seeing an implosion within church today with regard to the issue of women pastors, which the Bible clearly prohibits. But many under the guise of love are saying that the church ought to be structured differently in the spirit of love and compassion that way. So men, the issue for you is going to be learning to strike that important biblical balance with regard to a sacrificial love that maintains the proper roles of authority within the home. There is a right way and a wrong way to do that. We see that in the church, Christ has authority. Christ has never given up his authority in the church, yet he still loves the church sacrificially. Indeed, he gave himself for her. That's important. So keep that in mind, because oftentimes what's taught today is more of a form of egalitarianism with an abrogation of the man's leadership responsibilities within the home. That's not biblical. That's wrong. As a consequence of that teaching, we're seeing men who then are giving up their roles as the theologian of the home. And that's going to be significant as we cover what it is that men do in the home and how they lead and how they do it lovingly and sacrificially. And so, Lord willing, next Sunday we'll begin to tease out and delve into, I'm going to reach back into some of the Puritan teachings like I did with uh, the women on submission, and I've got some great quotes and some great insights from some pastors of the past who will give us some guidance on the practical application of what this looks like day in and day out for a Christian husband.
The good news is that Jesus Christ is our Savior, and we can rest in His finished work, and we can go to Him when we don't do things that we ought to do, or when we give up on the things that we should do. Confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us. And men, if you're not leading and loving in your home as you're called to, as a Christian husband, that is sin. That is sin. And you need to ask God to forgive you, and you need to repent of that, and repentance means turning and going the opposite direction. That's what it is. And so, keep that in mind. The purpose of studying God's Word is to build us up in the most precious faith and to live in accordance with God's goodwill and purpose for our lives as believers. I trust that you know the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't, you can call upon his name and you shall be saved. You shall be saved. And he'll give you the ability then to comprehend and to love his word and to treasure it and follow it. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your instruction. Thank you for our time today. Help us to comprehend what it is that you have for us. Help us to, as men, and love our wives as Christ has loved the church. Help us to understand these principles and concepts. May Scripture govern how we live in our marriages, Lord. May Scripture be the arbiter of what we do and say and act and how we act. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.